I'm glad you are sitting right next to me. Yes, because, I mean, we, we all can relate to this. Growing up, I mean, just some few, 10, 15 years ago, girls weren't really allowed to play with gadgets. I mean, if you're a girl, I'm sure you can attest to this fact. Yes, and, and for you being here, it's, it's, it's like a, a ban on that misconception. So thank you for availing yourself. Thank you for having me. All right. So then I'll go straight into my first question, starting with you. How was it like growing up? Were you the shark brain in school? You know, there are some girls in school who you can't beat. You know, right? There is that one girl in class. Were you one of those girls? Not at all. <laughs> so tell us, tell us how education was like for you. Um, so I, I'm, most of my education has been here in Ghana, right? From junior high school to senior high school to university. Um, unlike what she was saying, I wasn't your typical shark. But you also wouldn't find me in the class that's 50% and below. I used to like having fun with my friends. I used to love dancing, listening to music. Um, but I still knew that you had to sit down and study. Um, but for me, growing up, I had the opportunity to interact with the computer because most of the time I was left home alone. Um, so I, I, that was when I started to build the interest into technology. Um, but I'll say I got really, really serious with my studies um, after senior high school, where I actually wrote my WASI and I failed terribly. E's, F's, C's, B, B, A, O. And uh, my mom was like, I remember the day I came out of the exam hall and she asked me, how did the paper go? And I said, mommy, this one, yeah, I've danced it off. Because I used to join dancing groups in senior high school. Um, but I did have the opportunity to ride North Deck, and I came out w with A's and B's. And that was because now I was more serious, I wasn't distracted, um, and I really knew that I wanted to make it, and I got the opportunity to go to university. Um, so it was ups and downs, lots of failures, but I pushed myself through it. Wow, thank you very much. What was growing up like for you in terms of education? Um. It was something that my parents were very, they wanted to ensure that all us were, all the siblings were very educated, all their children, sorry. So um, especially growing up in a, my dad was in the Church of Pentecost as an apostle, so. Oh, so you're an apentizan. Uh, a, a pastor, so you understand a, a, a the PK discipline. growing up, yeah. <laughs> so it was important for them that all the kids had a, um, were examples, especially amongst the youth and amongst young people in the church. So education was always instilled on us, something important. Yeah. And also for my mum especially, she saw it as something that we could always fall back on. If everything else goes wrong, you have your education, you have the knowledge to be able to do things. Yeah. So something she always instilled in us, make sure you learn and you study to ensure that if anything happens, you always have your education to fall back on. Great. Tell us about yours, doctor. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think not far different uh, from what they uh, experienced. I mean, I think mine is more of a very humble beginning because um, I grew up in Atibibu, which is in the Brown Hapu region, um, mainly known for yam, so not education. But um, I think I, as a little child in primary school, I just got curious with my surroundings and um, seeing plants and thinking of how I can use them to cure HIV AIDS and then um, right into Wellcom Trust. In Not to stop you, doctor, you were thinking of how to cure HIV AIDS as a kid? Yes. Wow. So, <laughs> yeah, so that, that was how it started and then I wrote a letter to Wellcom Trust in the UK so they used to send me magazine, and I think when I was taking my title, I ticked doctor, and I think my parents were very angry that um, I'm dreaming too high to become a doctor, and then uh, graciously at age 29, I got my PhD. So, wow. yes, so, yeah. Now let's delve into your current organizations and how you came about them. I'll start with you. Mr. Samuel, I know that you started your company during the COVID-19, yeah. Yeah, so um, 
during the pandemic, I was in London at the time, and I was an account director for an organization called The Guardian, which are like um, a huge news organization. And because of the impacts of the pandemic, a lot of businesses around the world couldn't afford to employ full-time staff or grow their businesses. Likewise, um, I'm a Ghanaian. So every Christmas, my wife and I would go to Ghana. And coming to Ghana every year, I'd see how many overly skilled and talented young people that were not working. And for me, it made no sense. Because in the UK, there are individuals who are nowhere near as skilled and nowhere near as talented as the individuals in Ghana, yet they're all working. So it used to always, I don't know, it was, just, it was heavy on my heart. It was something that I just wanted to resolve. So it got towards the end of the middle of 2020, and it just got laid heavily on my heart, do something. So I thought of a way to, to connect these young individuals in Ghana with organizations in the UK. So initially, I started with the individuals in Ghana working remotely. I began with a few people. And the, the young people in Ghana did so well. So just to give a background, as an organization, the services we provide are um, virtual or business assistance. So they will assist businesses in any capacity they can within any department. Customer service, they will sit in Ghana and will do customer service for organizations around the world. Um, software development, um, development of all sorts. Um, we're at a STEM conference, I don't have to go into depth about development. Um, web development, web development. And they were doing so well for a lot of these organizations that organizations started telling other organizations in the UK and around the world of how great Ghanaian students were. So we went from one staff member in November 2020. In Ghana right now, in our office in Ridge, we now have 70 young people who are all there working for over 90 plus organizations around the world, across 10 countries, and we're quickly and rapidly growing. Because of the foundation that the young people set in Ghana, next year we'll be expanding into Rwanda and Kenya, God willing, Zimbabwe, Nigeria, South Africa. But the main point is that it all began in Ghana. And these young people showing how skilled and talented they are. So over the course of the last year, we've grown drastically and will continue to grow. So that's the genesis of the Doctor, business. Doctor, you are, you are associated with Belinda and um, Bills. Can, can you tell us how that came about? Thank you very much. Um, I think with uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, it was uh, more or less because of my work um, as a scientist during my PhD. So I had the opportunity to present my work at different uh, conferences. And so mm -hmm. that's how I became a scholar and I had uh, a lot of grants from them traveling to present my work in uh, different parts of the world. So awesome. Lady, Lady Omega, you, you, are, you are spearheading a lot of innovations for women, right? Um, yes, no. Um, so for my company, we build software applications, so web and mobile applications for businesses. Um, but on the side, I do have STEMBs where we offer practical experiments because we felt like, I mean, schooling here in Ghana, a lot of the um, subjects were very theoretical. So in these schools, yeah. we go there, we build robots, we make very practical experiments for them to understand the concepts mm -hmm. that have been taught in class. So at the end of the day, it's not just about, hey, STEM is fun, come, yeah. let's do something, but rather creating something that's of value, not just to yourself, but also to your environment. Why, why is innovation and STEM important now? Why is STEM and innovation important in, in, our, in our lives today? So I think um, the COVID pandemic really woke us up and made us realize that if we are not taking care of our environment and ourselves, we are going to be putting ourselves in a lot of trouble. And another thing too that became very evident was that we as Africans or as Ghanaians need to be able to come up with our very own innovations that we can also export to other African countries. 
And I think STEM enables us to be able to identify these problems and actually have some sort of solution for it. It creates an environment where you can do the calculations, you can have estimations, you can make assumptions to experiment what a potential solution is gonna be like. And innovations really is what is um, steering or bringing in the revenues right now into the country. Even with the e-levy and them talking about Momo, if a, a couple of years back or 10 years back, if MTN hadn't thought of this innovation, will we be talking about this tax today? So it's important that STEM is highlighted and made very relevant because we experience them in our everyday lives, from cooking food to heating our water to engaging with devices and even going in our cars every day. But the more we make it practical, the more we make um, the solutions realistic to what we can use and not just exporting solutions from outside of Africa here. So I think it's really, really important in these times so that in the next 10 years or 20 years, we'll have a better response to things like a pandemic and we'll also have a varied amount of solutions that we can use for ourselves. Awesome. Doctor, what do you think are some of the um, behaviors we should adapt in terms of working towards um, a STEM change in, in an environment like Ghana? You mentioned that at a young age you were thinking of how to uh, come up with a cure for AIDS. I'm sure most of us were watching Captain Planet or something. But you, at that young age, was it like a, the first go-to place for you to sit down and learn? Because for most of us, the, the first go-to place is not the book. Not at all. So what, what do you think are some of the behaviors we can adapt? Um, I think it, it wouldn't be uh, fair to look like Rosie. I think I didn't have the privilege to watch cartoons. So it was an agricultural environment, and I don't think I had the strength to farm either. But I think even though there wasn't light at that time, but I had the motivation to, to read the books as my go-to place. And I felt school was a safe haven for me, uh, where I could escape from chores and sending around. So, but I think um, the reason why I even came back to Ghana was based on experience. What I felt would have helped me achieve what I wanted to have achieved earlier was the fact that uh, maybe our education system does not stimulate creativity um, and it does not um, stimulate problem solving. As the key speaker rightly mentioned, we need to start training problem solvers. And uh, problem solvers become innovators and they become job creators rather than job seekers. So I think if we're able to um, reconscientize our education system and our mindset to rather train problem solvers, people who can identify problems and come out with innovative solutions, I think uh, people will then appreciate the field. Um, as COVID has come, if we begin to work out and we see Ghanaian scientists uh, producing vaccines, I think we've seen people sequencing the genome and students hear that. They get excited and they want to be in the front line. But um, if we don't inculcate that, uh, most of the times it's chew and poor. Yeah. What you can memorize and recall, you are the best student. But the ones that are creative, um, and I had a colleague um, in high school he used to be one of the smartest when it comes to STEM. So they used to pick him around. He could uh, design projector with raw materials. He did ship. But because he had learning disability, dyslexia, you know those smart people take their time to think before they put in. The education system is a rush. So the one who finished exam fast is the best. And he never finished exams. We all know the thing, but he never finished. So I have been able to rise up, but with all, the ta with all his talent, he's currently in a rural community teaching. So we have lost a great brain for nothing. Mm. So I think we need to be able to, in, uh, I mean, be more inclusive yeah. in our education system to take uh, those people with special need and help them to also achieve their goal. I think that's the way forward. Thank you. That's awesome. Mr. Samuel, you have had experiences of both worlds. What do you think 
uh, some of the things that we can adapt as Ghanaian youth and young innovators. Uh, what are some of these um, behaviors that the, in the UK um, is quite manifesting in, in terms of STEM that Ghanaians, you, Ghanaian youth can, can adapt? I don't think that there's anything that the Ghanaian youth needs to uh, ad ad adapt from my perspective. Okay. I think that the talent, the intelligence, they're all here on the continent already. I don't think we need to um, try and copy what the West are doing in any way, shape or form. In actual fact, the only issue with the continent is just opportunities. opportunities. That's it. Yeah. The only reason young people will even consider going to another continent or another country is opportunities. Opportunity. If the opportunities are here, why would you want to leave home? Yeah. You look at the stats, um, I think between the ages of 15 to about 32, this is Africa's most educated generation. But of that age group, of the young people in Africa, there's over 150 million young people that are unemployed. That makes no sense. So if there are more young people who are, who are able to create more tech platforms and more businesses that can create opportunities for young people to work, mm. then that will solve a lot of the problems. Okay. I'm sure growing up you all had mentors, just as I'm sure as you're seated here, people are thinking, oh, I, I really want to tap into this, this lady's life. I really want to tap into that, that gentleman's life. Who, who were your mentors? Who were you looking up to when you were growing up? I'll start with you, Lady Omega. Um, for me, it was Dr. Joyce Ayi. Okay. I really admired um, how she occupied her yes. position, which was normally occupied by men, yes. and how she also worked with men. Mm. Um, irrespective of her role, how she managed in the ministry and still comported herself, she didn't have to wear trousers mm. or look like a man. She looked yes. like herself. And for me, that was really admirable, and I still do admire her and the impact that she has over young people. So I'm still learning from her. Awesome. Um, growing up, I had three people I looked up to. I, would, I wouldn't have said mentors, but I looked up to. Mm -hmm. My first two were my parents, yeah. because of what they were able to accomplish from coming from Ghana to the UK and what they were able to accomplish. Mm -hmm. But the third person, more randomly, is... Um, does, everyone knows Thierry Henry, right? Thierry, Thierry. Th Thierry Henry, Arsenal footballer. Right, well, ex-Arsenal footballer. So growing up, in the UK especially, there weren't many black people doing extraordinary things in the UK. You'd find that most of the black people that were doing things would be sidelined or wouldn't be recognized. But growing up, seeing what Thierry Henry did <laughs> in a predominantly white country and dominating not only the sport but encouraging young black people that no matter where you are, you can do something, mm. for me, that was hugely inspiring especially when he would score goals and his celebrations. It used to give me a lot of vim. Mm. So he was a huge inspiration to me because he made me realize that if he could do it, mm. coming from where he came from in France, coming to the UK and being the top at his field, mm. then we can all do it. So it gave me that confidence that I could push on. Okay. Doctor, who, who were some of the people you looked up to? I think um, considering where I grew up, I... I wasn't exposed to the outside world more often, so I think the people around me, mainly um, those that had just gone to, because at the standard at that time was um, training college. When mm -hmm. you finish senior high school and you write several of decks and you go into training college, they throw a party. So my senior cousin, uh, um, Abbas, yeah. is currently with uh, National Health Insurance. He was like the go-to person. He set the yeah. standards for me. But uh, Inspector Bedi Akon, uh, the drama series, was a stimulating oh, wow. stuff for me at that time. So, wow. Yeah, so, so. <laughs> okay. I, I, know, I know that being where you are now would, wasn't a smooth ride. There was definitely some, some high and lows. I mean, it, it wasn't all smooth. Tell us what some of those challenges were and how you were able to overcome them, starting with you, Doctor. Yeah, so I think um, he rightly mentioned um, opportunities. And when you travel out and you interact, you realize that we are all special and we have special abilities, just that we didn't have the opportunity earlier on to get exposed to it. And um, I think everything is about experience. What we are and what we become is shaped by our experiences. And so I'm very happy to see this young uh, 
students come up today to hear our experiences that will shape them to propel them to a greater height. If we probably had this opportunity, we might have been more than sure. what we sure. are today. So I think it's mainly opportunities. And then um, in terms of challenges, um, sometimes we meet people that we look up to and they demoralize us. Um, but we need to have an inner desire. I think when I was, uh, I finished university and I was applying for a job, I went to an interview and I was asked, um, where do I see myself in the next five years? And there was a professor on the panel and I was, I was trying to get onto the job to get experience and give back, but I see myself going to do a master's degree and come back to support. And he got angry that um, a small boy, you come and you said you want to, to go and do your master's. And that was the end of the interview. Really? Yes. But when I came out of the interview, I motivated myself that I'm going to do PhD and come back to embarrass him. <laughs> yes. And um, I didn't even do master's. That was quite the motivation. Yes. <laughs> I didn't even do master's. I got the opportunity. So sometimes um, you get some of these roadblocks, but you have to dig Yes. deep within you to keep on going and that's why I try to give back for some of the challenges I face so that the next generation wouldn't face those hurdles. Yes. Awesome. So Mr. Samuel, what, what were those challenges for you setting up your business um, for instance and how did you overcome them and what lessons did you pick out of those challenges? Um, the challenges for me in regards to the business was just understanding the systems in Ghana. Mm. Um, naturally, I grew up in the UK, so the systems are very different to the systems in Ghana. Now, um, a lot of people like to make comparisons and would say one system is better than the other, and I personally disagree. I just think systems are different. There are certain things that can be done better, but um, me understanding the way things were done in Ghana just took a bit of time mm. and patience. Mm. Because again, um, you can't come somewhere and expect the system to adapt to you. You need to come and understand how things are done in a certain place, really understand how you can get around things and build on that. So that was some of my challenges in Ghana. And by the grace of God, I learned quickly. I had good people around me to help me understand the systems. And in doing so, we were able to build a successful business. Okay, Lady Omega. Um, for me, it was, it was very interesting because I was just coming out of a software entrepreneurship program. Um, I didn't, I was not like back in school again. I was not part of the shacks in the class, mm -hmm. um, but I knew that I was thriving with my tech skills. Mm -hmm. So I told myself I wanted to be the best at whatever I did. Yeah. And that also influenced myself and mm -hmm. my team. So even in um, getting our first client, I said, we didn't, ha we didn't know anybody. As a young person, you're now building your network. Mm. You're now trying to get some money to feed yourself. Mm. In the beginning, it was tough. There were times where we had to buy Kofi Brookman mm. and have that for, for... The hustle is real. Yeah, you know, and it wasn't because I couldn't go home to go and eat your loaf. Yeah. But it was because I knew that I had to sacrifice yeah. at that time to build my company. Exactly. Like he was saying, unfortunately, um, the Ghanaian system is now built in, in a way to mm -hmm. encourage young companies. Mm -hmm. So you always have to like put in a lot of effort mm -hmm. um, to get your contracts, first of all, get your clients, get your books in place. Um, getting professionals to help you mm -hmm. because you can't do it all on your own. I had to learn it the hard way, um, but I noticed that at the end of the day, because I wanted to be excellent at whatever I did, it was the sacrifice I had to pay. And another thing that I also talk about is how we waste our time. Yeah. So before I started my software company, I mean, I would gladly go to the salon, spend three to six hours braiding my hair and not care about how much time I had spent there. And now that I started my company, I realized every, every minute counts. Like I could be using that time to do something. And I like to encourage every young person here, the Instagrams, the Facebooks, the Snapchats you're looking at, they're making money already. You have to build your skill set. I'm not saying all those things are not good, but invest your time in the right things. Invest your time in audio, audio books if you don't like reading, like physical books. I had to study. I had to learn. I had to know how software apps are built. Before, I, I was coming from an engineering background. 
into a technology background, which was totally different because it was surveying dramatic engineering. And I had to burn the midnight candle so that I could understand the business I was doing. Life is not straightforward. And if life was easy, everybody will be doing it. But what you, the little things, little, really, little drops of water do make a mighty ocean. And my little small company here in Accra was able to support businesses in Ghana, Nigeria, the United States, and the United Kingdom. It, wasn't, it didn't come with just me sitting down, folding my arms, watching Netflix for two, three hours. I changed the kind of hairstyles I was doing. I made, made sure that my friends weren't also wasting my time. I was learning a lot, watching good educative videos on YouTube. And I would emphasize again, YouTube is really great, but it can also like waste your time. But at the end of the day, I always say with a young person, your hunger for risk is higher, so you have the opportunity to do more. Do not waste your time when you're young. Make good use of your time, volunteer, get to know people and build your network. Because at the end of the day, your network is your net worth. Now, before we come into the advice, which you've already, you've given a brilliant one, tell us what's next for you, Mr. Samuel. What is next for, for Remotely? So, next for Remotely, the, um, the long-term aim over the next five to 10 years mm -hmm. is to employ one million young people across mm. Africa. So, next wow. year, we want to ensure, so we want to ensure that we're, more them, <laughs> we want to ensure that we're getting more young people in Ghana, firstly, mm -hmm. into employment then we're going to, going to start expanding into other African countries. Mm -hmm. In our first year, um, a, a lot of people aren't fully aware of the genesis of the story because mm -hmm. when most people hear the accent, they'll assume that I came to Ghana already with a lot of money to Irish, invest in my business. I know. <laughs> but it's, it's not true. Yeah. When, when, when I came to Ghana in December 2020, I came with nothing. Yeah. It was me, my wife, who's down there, Give, 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 give us a wave, darling. Please, let's, there let, she let, is. let's, let's give a round of applause <laughs> My wife. for her. And we have, we have two kids, two wow. children, that we um, had to make a sacrifice with wow. and leave with my mother in Manchester in the UK. Yeah. So when we came to Ghana, we came with nothing. My business didn't pay me for the first seven months of the year. So we'll literally, people won't know, you'll see me, and you'll be like, hey, this guy, he's, he's doing yeah. all right. Yeah. You get. And but, then, of course, because you were on The Apprentice, that, that was, you know, that was a great show to be on in the UK yeah. because it created a lot of opportunities in the UK. But in Ghana, an apprentice, it, it, I mean, it, course, it, it doesn't course. mean anything here. <laughs> so being here and setting yeah. up initially was difficult. We went through a lot of challenges, a lot of struggles. When people would hear my accent anywhere I'd go, what was originally one price mm. was suddenly double or triple. Mm. So I had to learn a, a lot of hard lessons very early on. Yeah. But honestly, the, the grace of God and just resilience took us through. So a year down the line, we've been able to build a sustainable and successful business. And God willing, moving forward, we'll continue to grow and employ more young people on the continent. So Doc, what is the next thing for you? Yeah, um, as, yes, as um, with the university, um, I came back, as I said, in 2018. Yeah. Uh, currently, I have um, supervised about five MPhil students to a successful completion and um, working on the rest. So to give, um, I mean, impact whatever I got mm -hmm. back to the society. And with the NGO, we have employed around 150 people to be involved in um, different projects in education and health. So with the, with the NGO, the aim is to be able to expand beyond Ghana to other African countries to uh, encourage participation in uh, STEAM, uh, both STEM and art, mm. uh, to foster creativity and innovation so that we'll be able to transform the young generation and the new African country. And as he said, it takes a lot of effort. Yes. Um, he came with his wife. I have to leave my wife in the UK and uh, come and give back to society. So wow. uh, nothing is easy. You well, might please see, give it up for the sacrifice. Yes, yeah, yeah, so we might see things as if they are rosy, yes. but uh, eventually we we had to have sleepless nights mm. to eventually get to where we were. And when I started the NGO, it was mainly from my salaries and students volunteering until we got partnership with MasterCard Foundation mm. and now we're doing uh, big projects. So yes, uh, hopefully we want to see a transformation in the next generation.
Doc, starting from you again, what then, are, what then is the advice for young people who are hungry for, for success, especially for career in STEM? I think um, first thing is based on the experience when I came back. I think um, the youth are in hurry. They are interested in fame, money, and power. So I want to be the CEO. I want to finish quick. I want to do this. And everything has to be with purpose, with motive. So students come into the university, they are in a hurry to finish and get the certificate. But you didn't come into the institution for certificate. You came there for knowledge. So the certificate is just a paper to show that you have acquired the knowledge. So if at the end of your training you don't have the knowledge, you don't even need to go for the certificate. So students need to know that there is a need for experience. And um, again, on the part of parent, you don't only know what your child will want to do based on when his results come. So parents will text me, oh, my child got 20, which course can he do? No. You need to be able to expose your child to different professions. Send him to maybe Legon with a professor do internship, as Madame said, or send them for attachment. See where their interest lies and build them up in that field rather than wait until the Awasi results come and you say, oh, this one is for medicine, this one is for pharmacy. And we, de we take decision for them instead of allowing them to make their choice. And um, so I think with the youth, I would en encourage you to focus on network, as you said. Get network, get experience from people that have gone through so that they can share the knowledge they have acquired and their problems so that your pathway will be much easier. So experience, experience, experience. Make sure you gain much experience. Mm. That is what will propel you to a greater height. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Samuel, what would, you, what would be your advice? My advice to all the young people here would be focus on your why. Mm. Why do you want to do the things that you want to do? Um, Leslie Ann is one of the individuals who set up this event. And a few months ago, we had a really good conversation um, over a video call. And we were talking about exchange programs, she mentioned to me, of Ghanaians going to America and Americans coming to Ghana. <laughs> now, when the, Ameri when the Ghanaians, I believe, if, if I'm not mistaken, Liz, the end, were um, talking about being in engineering, their main concern was money. How much money are they gonna make from being in the field? How much money will their jobs pay them? Money, money, money. With the Americans, their main focus was on what impact mm -hmm. can we make? And you tend to find that the individuals who have a focus on creating a global impact are the ones who go on to be successful because your motivation isn't money. When we all one day get called to glory, what will you be remembered for? Will it be of the impact you've made or the money you've accumulated? Your focus should always be impact. What do I want to accomplish? What do I want to impact? What do I want to change? Through that, wealth will come mm. as a byproduct, but the first part should always be your why. And the second piece of advice is, don't wait on people to, for opportunities to come. You can't wait on the government for opportunities to come. You can't wait on politicians or on senior leaders. You have to create the change for yourself. If you look at any country around the world, the individuals who have gone on and made significant impacts, in most instances have come from nothing, but have gone on to create global organizations based off a hunger and a real why. So what is your why? Why do you want to do the things you want to do and what impact do you want to make on the world? Your why. All right, so finally, so you've already mentioned, so kindly make it brief. <laughs> okay, um, so I think you missed me in my updates from my company, okay. what's next okay. for us. Um, so next year, I'm looking forward to launching some apps for businesses that have been built by African developers. 
And for STEMBIES, what we are also doing is to build um, bio or create biodegradable sanitary pads. Wow. So I'd like to give a shout out to all the girls here. If you'll be interested in being a part of the project, please just go to stembies.org and just send us a message and we'll see how you can participate. But my final advice will be, as a young person, who do you believe in? There's no way you can do everything that we are saying without your grounding. I believe in God. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Mm -hmm. And for each and every single one of us here, we have a purpose and we have a reason here on earth. If you're still figuring out who you are, please take time out and pray mm -hmm. and ask God to show you what you are supposed to do and what your identity is. Once you figure that out, the rest will come. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and everything else will be added unto you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was quite insightful. What I'm taking away with me is three, experience, seek, your, seek for impact and seek God. Thank you very much, lady and gentlemen. I hope you had a good time. I hope you penned some things down. You did, right? Let's, let's do a quick Q&A. Thank you very much. Um, so, as you said, um, my background was also from the rural community, and the main reason I started Help All Africa was because of that, because if I had prayer experience or exposure or guidance, maybe I would have done more than I could have done. So up north with Help All Africa, um, one of our projects is Advanced Science Technology Education, which is promoting STEAM. Um, well, STEM basically is the motherboard. So science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Now, the bottom line is that this is a field that allow creativity, problem solving, and innovation. So any field that you can be involved in this is a, a STEAM. And I wanted to demystify the notion where when people are going to high school to do home economics, they don't consider it as a STEM, when in actual sense it's a STEM. Because by buying ingredients, you cannot cook but you need to be creative and innovative to mix this ingredient to become food that will not let you run diarrhea. By going to do visual arts, in Ghana you relegate the people to background, that people that are not smart will do visual arts. But this beautiful edifice we are seeing was people who did art, visual arts went into uh, metallics or went into architecture that have been creative and innovative enough to come out with this edifice. So STEM doesn't mean when you go to high school you do science. STEM means whatever you do that you can be creative, innovative, and solve problems. So doing visual arts, home economics, um, uh, agri, general art, um, because general art people eventually become GIS. So everything is STEM, but you have to find your purpose, obviously, as she said, and then you have to have a motivation to make impact. And based on your strength, you could be um, doing home science and you'll be known globally because your focus is to make an impact in that field. But if you go to do science, but that's not your purpose, you will not be known. So it's about helping us, uh, maybe going into schools and educating students. And as I said, the experience. If the person has prior experience of all these fields, then they'll be able to know their uh, purpose uh, that God has brought them to F with and then to be able to make the right impact in those fields. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's a very good question. I think if you notice, I don't know whether Leslie and the team uh, were, how they were able to assemble all of us. And at the end of the day, you realize that we all have the same mindset. Yeah. Yeah. The which, first which thing, I mean, all the decision I have made, when he spoke, that is basically what is keeping me going. When she spoke, that is what keeps me going. 
There is no decision that I make that I don't involve God. There is no decision. So you need to have that divine direction. And as he said, my purpose on earth is to leave a footprint, an impact. So that was it. And as they said, in every situation there's roadblock. And I would say that I haven't achieved what I, have, I, wanted, um, what I want to achieve, so I'm not a big man yet. So I'm still a small boy. But um, when I transitioned from undergraduate, and not even in Legon, I did my undergraduate in UDS, which uh, at that time you consider was not well resourced. And then moving from undergraduate straight to a PhD, and going into uh, University of Nottingham, that is known globally, Obviously, you get that shock. You need to do masters, but PhD is doctor of philosophy, so independent. You don't need, you don't have meat. You have to solve your own problem. And I remember when I first met my supervisors, literally all the things they said, I didn't hear anything. Because <laughs> whatever they were, I was just looking for one word. When I hear the word, I write it, waiting to go to Professor Google to search and read. They introduced me to PCR and all that. So again, it has to be a desire from within. Uh, she was asking, who do you believe? You need to believe in yourself. You need to know you want to make an impact. And during those challenges, I think the song I used to motivate myself when I'm walking at night was uh, R2B's Wallahi, Babi Amadru Nubankuma. Yeah. Yeah, so, <laughs> so where I have gotten to... I haven't reached my final well, destination, well, so I'm not giving up. So that was it. You don't give up, and eventually you'll fit in into the society. So don't underestimate your potential. And as he said, once the right opportunity comes, you'll be given the right platform to excel. Thank you. Thank you. The reason I really like that question is because it's a question every young entrepreneur has. I need investment or capital to start my business, and it's a valid point. When I started my business, I had nothing but an idea. I had nothing, I came to Ghana, and I didn't know the system, right? So you find that a lot of entrepreneurs who come to Ghana, it's all about the way in which you tackle a problem, right? You do not need capital or investment to start a business. I repeat, you do not need capital or investment to start a business, or you will never start. You will never start. So let's say, for example, you run a, I don't know, in my instance, right? I had no clients. What I started doing, I started reaching out to people and pitching them my business even though there was nothing there. I would call, I would go on LinkedIn, I will tell them about my business, what my business did, and I would sell and sell. I contacted over, how many people? Over 10,000 people I contacted. Wow. I went and went, and eventually one person said, I'll use your service. One. I could have given up after the first 100 contacts, I could have given up after the first 1,000 contacts. I could have given up after the first 2,124 contacts. But I kept going. When eventually one person said yes to me, I knew that if one person says yes, there must be others who will say yes as well. So I just kept going. The reason I've been able to do it is because not many young people will do that. Most of us will get a few rejections, and we stop. Then we want the easy route, give me money, and then I'll set up. But that's not the best way to go about it. Because now with what I've created, off of nothing, if I now want investment, I can ask for more equity, because I've proven my model with nothing. So get, go out and pitch your idea as if it's there. Pitch it, pitch it, pitch what I did, and I got the money. Once I got the money, then I hired somebody. Once I hide somebody, what I'd got from the money, I could then invest into what I was doing. And then I did it again. Pitch, pitch, pitch. Money bought. 
done that to the point where I gained profit margin, then I used the profits to invest in the business, and I went again. So pitch what you have as if it's something, even though it's not there. Faith. Believing in something as if it's there, though it's not there. Like our faith in Christ. Most people don't believe in Christ because they want to see something tangible, feel it, believe it. But we believe in Christ even though most people may not see, feel, or understand it. We believe based on faith. Have faith in your idea. Have faith in what you're building. Have faith in your business. And if you have that faith, you will push on and keep going. And eventually, you'll see the fruits of your labor coming through and it will grow into a huge business.